inflation was the talk of the town in May, but bond markets remained largely disinterested. The US 10-year ended the month at 1.61%, only two basis points higher than it started, and the 30-year ended at 2.30, also two basis points higher. As a result, despite the concerns over inflation, normal US bonds posted positive total return. Credit spreads remain resolutely tight and total returns are modestly positive across credit qualities. Equity markets continue to reach new highs. Financials, energy and materials led sector returns, while technology, communication services and consumer discretionary were negative for the month. A pattern consistent with the now consensus reopening and recovery narrative. Equity volatility remained largely unchanged, with the VIX starting end of the month just below 17. However, volatility was rife outside of additional assets, where cryptocurrencies received significant attention with both their speculative rise and the subsequent fall in price, seemingly on the keystrokes of Elon Musk's tweets. In traditional currencies, the USD was broadly weaker against most G10 currencies, with the exception of the yen. Commodities markets continued to perform strongly with oil, gold and copper all up for the month. In the month of May, markets were surprised by both US employment and inflation numbers, but took the data largely in their stride. Earlier in the month, the employment report uh, missed expectations by a record amount. And just a few days later, inflation surprised on the upside, with year-on-year -year CPI hitting 4.2% versus 3.6% expected. The accepted explanations seem to be that the undershoot in employment was driven not by a lack of jobs being created, but rather by a lack of employees willing to fill those openings. And the inflation pickup seemed to be driven by a combination of uh, supply chain blockages and base effects. Overall, despite these surprises, US growth largely delivered on expectations, with Q1 GDP coming in at 6.4%, PMIs remaining strongly in expansionary territory, COVID cases decreasing and vaccination rates rising. Also, monetary policy looks set to remain accommodative and any talk of tapering uh, by the Federal Reserve to be widely telegraphed. In Europe instead, most countries have only started accelerating their vaccination rollouts, with the only exception of the UK that is moving potentially towards a full reopening at the end of June. One notable characteristic of markets throughout the pandemic has been just how forward-looking equity markets have been, particularly when faced with fundamental data outside of typical ranges. Today, as the recovery continues to gather steam, Overall consensus feels like markets are asking what happens after reopening. Expectations for fundamentals remain high, transitory inflation appears priced in, and stimulus remains accommodative. However, employment support programs will eventually roll off, and at some point central banks will hint at talking about tapering. As such, we continue to emphasize upside participation through owning cyclical equities, but balancing this with diversification in the form of long-dated government bonds such as US Treasuries. Admittedly, during Q1, holding duration felt like paying for an insurance policy that wasn't required. However, given April and May price action, US government bonds appear to have priced in some of the higher growth and inflation outcomes we've just discussed. Additionally, in today's low yielding environment, long dated US treasuries offer relatively attractive levels of yield, with the ability to provide diversification in the event of a growth disappointment. Meanwhile, cyclical equities continue to deliver on earnings and, in our opinion, are more likely to outperform versus longer duration growth areas such as large cap tech if rates do rise further due to improving growth prospects. Outside of developed government bonds, we continue to be positioned for a convergence in emerging market bond yields, especially in the local currency space. Whilst we can't know what the future holds, what we do know is that markets rarely progress in a straight line over an extended period of time. As a result, in our view, the balance in our portfolios today allows for three things. Firstly, upside participation. Secondly, downside protection in case of a growth shock. And then finally, an ability to meaningfully respond to any future episodic opportunities, which we feel is going to be crucial to generating returns in today's low yielding world. Thank you for watching and see you next time.